All right, welcome to St. <laughs> Timothy's Episcopal Church Saturday Night Live uh, evening prayer service. We're thrilled you have joined us either by Zoom or on the phone. My name is Mary Ann Scott and I'll be serving as your virtual verger. As your virtual verger, when we begin, I'll be muting you as always. And I do have my virtual verge tonight. Uh, so <laughs> we don't get any feedback with so many of us gathered. Uh, also, as a reminder, during our service, there will be opportunities to use the chat button below on your toolbar. Please access chat for entering prayer requests, regular responses like thanks be to God, and for any thanksgivings that you would like to share with us. And now I'm going to mute everyone. And Chuck, would you like to go ahead and start? Uh, yes, Marian, thank you. Light and peace in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Our mighty God, you have given your Holy Son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life. Give us grace to receive thankfully the fruits of his redeeming work and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns, with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Psalm 45. My heart is stirring with a noble song. Let me recite what I have fashioned for the King. My tongue shall be the pen of a skilled writer. You are the fairest of men. Grace flows from your lips because God has blessed you forever. Strap your sword upon your thigh, O oh mighty warrior, in your pride and in your majesty. Ride out and conquer in the cause of truth and for the sake of justice. Your right hand will show your marvelous things your arrows are very sharp, O oh mighty warrior. The peoples are falling at your feet, and the king's enemies are losing heart. Your throne, O oh God, endures forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate iniquity. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with oil of gladness above your fellows. All your garments are fragrant with myrrh, alloy, and cassia, and the music of strings from ivory palaces makes you glad. King's daughters stand among the ladies of the court. On your right hand is a queen adorned with the gold of a pure. Hear, O oh daughter, consider and listen closely. Forget your people and your father's house. The king will have pleasure in your beauty. He is your master. Therefore, do him honor. The people of Tyre are here with a gift. The rich among the people seek your favor. All glorious is a princess as she enters. Her gown is cloth of gold. In embroidered apparel she has brought to the king. After her, the bridesmaids follow in procession. With joy and gladness they are brought and enter into the palace of the king. In place of fathers, O king, you shall have sons. You shall make them princes over all the earth. I will make your name to be remembered from generation to another. Therefore, nations will praise you forever and ever. Here ends the psalm. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. At that time, says the Lord, 
I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. When Israel sought for rest, the Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Again, I will build you, and you shall be built, O virgin Israel. Again, you shall take your tambourines and go forth in the dance of the merrymakers. Again, you shall plant vineyards on the mountains of Samaria. The planter shall plant and shall enjoy the fruit. For there shall be a day when sentinels will call in the hill country of Ephraim, Come, let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. For thus says the Lord, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, Save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth. Among them, the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor, together, a great company, they shall return here. With weeping, they shall come, and with consolations, I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd a flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and has redeemed him from hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall become like a watered garden, and they shall never languish again. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will give the priests their fill of fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my bounty, says the Lord. Here ends the reading. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a, Sabbath's day, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. Here ends the reading.
let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and redeemer. A priest dies and is waiting in line at the pearly gates. Ahead of him is a, is a guy dressed in sunglasses and a loud shirt, leather jacket and jeans. St. Peter addresses this cool guy. Who are you? So that I may know whether you, whether or not to admit you to the kingdom of heaven. The guy replies, I'm Bruce, retired airline pilot from Toronto. St. Peter consults his list. He smiles and says to the pilot, take this silken robe and golden staff and enter the kingdom. The pilot goes into heaven with his robe and staff. Next, the priest, it's the priest's turn. He stands erect and booms out, I am Father John, pastor of St. Mary's for the last 43 years. St. Peter consults his list. He says to the priest, take this cotton robe and wooden staff and enter the kingdom. Just a minute, says the good father. That man was a pilot and he gets a silken robe and a golden staff and I get only cotton and wood. How can this be? Up here, we go by results, says St. Peter. When you preached, people slept. When he flew, people prayed. A commentary on Acts by Matt Skinner. Unfortunately, Jesus' ascension has become easy to overlook. Therefore, it's easily considered irrelevant. Creativity impaired liturgical traditions keep it hidden from plain sight when they insist we observe it on Thursdays. But even more damaging is the widespread ignorance of what the ascension might mean for our knowledge of who Jesus Christ is and our understanding of what Christians are supposed to do with themselves. Because so many churchgoers struggle to figure out how to relate the Easter confession of Christ is risen to the post-Pentecost challenges of real life. Again, it's the infamous disconnection between Sunday and Monday. This ignorance is really a shame. Don't get me wrong. I'm not asking preachers to use their sermons as opportunities to lecture about arcane, doctrinal, or historical ruminations on the ascension. Rather, by imaginatively taking congregations into the drama of these early verses from Acts. Preachers will help them discover how the ascension connects Jesus to life in the here and now. It establishes Jesus as Lord of all and calls Christians to participate boldly, yet attentively in his ongoing process among us. Context really matters. For understanding this passage. A sermon will benefit from accentuating the high degree of anticipation that suffuses the text. The Acts of the Apostles begins where the Gospels, according to Luke, left off. With grandiose expectations, all fueled by emerging recognition that God changed everything on that original Easter morning, before Jesus departs to an otherworldly existence, he lays out a few additional promises. After reaffirming that his followers will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come, he declares that God will empower them to be witnesses across the Roman world, beginning right where they are. In time, they will move throughout the broader Roman province of Judea, northward into Samaria, and ultimately to points unknown, the ends of the earth. Everyone, the people in the story, and the readers too, expects God to do something, to clothe Jesus' friends with power, and to call them into action. The apostles also understood the messianic import of what lies ahead. 
the question to Jesus about the restoration of Israel is perfectly reasonable. The Messiah is expected to purify the land and rule over the nations. Is this finally the time? Jesus' promises affirm that his ascension is not the end of the story. Rather, his departure initiates the next chapter in the story of God's salvation. While his words include a command, their dominant thrust is descriptive, almost matter of fact. He tells them what God will do and what their lives will look like as a result. No requests, no orders, no threats, no exhortations. Power, Holy Spirit, testimony about Jesus and forgiveness of sins, participation in God's reign, expansion across cultural and geopolitical lines, opposition. God has impressive things in store for these people as soon as Jesus moves on. Jesus' ascension takes him to the right hand of God. But what does that mean? The right hand of God. It's not a place as if we could find Jesus and his Father sitting in a throne somewhere or sharing a booth in, heaven, in a heavenly tavern. The reference is not so much location but to status. Jesus receives power and authority, call it sovereignty, glorification, or whatever. By virtue of his elevation to this status, Jesus reigns over all creation. Creation is his. He has a role in everything. Therefore, he is present throughout all creation through the Holy Spirit. Contrary to some popular assumptions, this event does not put Jesus out of play until the end of all things. He and the kingdom he inaugurated are not on an extended break. If our images of Jesus ascending contribute to a sense of Jesus's removal from human society in our daily experiences, then we've missed the point of ascension, at least as Acts 1 describes it. Don't get caught up in parsing the symbolic sites and imagery of the ascension narrative. Acts, operating out of its own heavenly assumptions, resists our questions of where and how. What Acts insists is that Jesus departs from his followers so that he might exercise his authority and influence over all things, places, and powers. The ascension does not mean the cessation of his ministry. It does not mean Jesus' absence. It does not mean the suspension of God's activity to reclaim the world. Quite the opposite. As mentioned, the verses preceding the ascension turn our attention toward what God will yet do, even as they claim that Jesus' followers will play a part in God's plan, and the plans are ambitious. This makes the verses 10 through 14 especially interesting. When the two messengers in robes, those angelic figures called Jesus' cloud-gazing apostles, back to their senses, they do not order them to get to work although there is urgency in the admonishment to stop staring into the sky. The moment's urgency does not result in immediate action. The first great act of the apostles when they hike back to Jerusalem and wait. Indeed, in time, the apostles and the rest of Jesus' followers will be moving outward and bearing witness to Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. But not yet. In time, the realities about which Jesus spoke, the kingdom of God, forgiveness of sins, release from the things that bind people will come into clearer view. We may find the waiting period at the beginning of Acts easy to skip over. As a brief narrative interlude, building suspense for the eventual coming of the Holy Spirit. Yet, the interval makes an important point about how God will interact with these people. Presumably, the Holy Spirit could have come immediately after Jesus' ascension, but God waits. Rather, God has Jesus' followers wait. I like to think that in this waiting, they learn, 
or begin to learn that they are to be a responsive community, a community that waits upon God to initiate, whether they walk back to Jerusalem from the ascension with eager energy or paralyzing fear. We don't know. All we know is that they have to wait. The waiting has an active quality to it, going beyond merely sitting around and contemplating the past and future. The apostles wait, secluded in the room upstairs, where they are constantly devoting themselves to prayer. Along with others who follow Jesus, both men and women, the group remains sequestered, yet expectant. In their waiting, they obey Jesus' recent commands, but even more, they also express a readiness for the wild stuff yet to come. The waiting period conditions them to be attentive to God so that they might respond when the time is right. They wait in a context of enormous and not fully explained expectations. They live in uneasy anticipation of the new realities that Jesus has initiated. Living like this requires just as much courage as if Jesus had told them to go out and immediately change the world using their own brains and muscles. They wait, not because they see it as their only option, because they expect big things to come from God, things in which they will be privileged to play important roles. Amen. The prayers of the people. In the course of the silence after each bidding, the people offer their own prayers either silently or feel free to use the Zoom chat. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our presiding Bishop Michael, for our Bishop Jennifer, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we are asked to pray for clergy and students of diocesan campus ministries. The Reverend Robert Abner, Episcopal and Lutheran Campus Ministries at Ball State. The Reverend Dr. Charles Allen, Grace Unlimited at Butler and IUPUI. The Reverend Dr. Hilary Cook, Chapel of the Good Shepherd at Purdue. Mr. Ricardo Andres Bello Gomez, Chair of Board of Directors, Episcopal Campus Ministry at IU. The Reverend Dawn Black, United Campus Ministries, Terre Haute. The Campus Ministries of DePaul University, Hanover College, Wabash College, and the University of Southern Indiana. I ask your prayers for Bishop Mauricio Andrade and the people of our Companion Diocese of Brasilia and for the people in Diocese of Haiti and St. Andre's School in Mithon, pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for go goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. I ask your prayers for all persons named on our prayer list and for those you bring on your hearts and minds today. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask for your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. I ask your thanksgiving for the lives of those parishioners who are celebrating their birthdays this week, including Joanne, Tom Ware, David Helt, Olivia Herndon, Walter Sparrow, and Marion Scott. And for those celebrating their anniversaries this week, including Christine and Odo Musimwa, and Franca and Ray Bradley. I ask your prayers for those on St. Timothy's prayer list. 
Sean Othier, Sharon Othier, Ellen Bell, Robin Blackwell, Jenny Brackett, Tessa Molly, Cassidy, Judy Champa, Gordon Chastain, Taquali Copeland, Carsa and Sarah Dennis, Becky Edwards, Mike Finqua, Lee Formo, Diana Good, David Hahn, Mickey Hathaway, The Helt Family, Caitlin Hahn, Matthew Ayara, Chris and Tim Kramer, Greg Latimer, Jean and Nancy Leffler, Ruth Love, Sefa Masali, Craig and Laura McKenna, Zach, Zach McLean, Jackie Means, Christine Musua, Charles and Marsha Park, Dan Poole, Jeremiah Poole, Erica and John Prey, Clint Robertson, Beth Robertson, Joseph and Linda Schettenbrunner, Michael Schettenbrunner, the medical staff and inmates at Marion County Jail, Mardine Wade, Adam, David, Delise, Trina, and Morris, Elizabeth, Evelyn, Jenny, Josephine, Catherine's parents in South Africa, Lily and family, the Navajo Nation, Renata, Ruth, Chanel, Thomas, and Tracy. For my brother Rick, who has heart surgery this coming week, the son of David Hahn, who has departed. For Adam and Renata's marriage and merger of their families. For Patricia Althier. And again, Thanksgiving for Chris's improved health. For PPE for all healthcare providers, teachers, and all on the front lines. And may they have the wisdom to wear properly for all who are becoming weary of COVID isolation and precautions. Would you go ahead with the uh, Lord's Prayer, please? Yes, thank you, Chuck. Please say this together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And I'd like to apologize before uh, we conclude our service um, for my, my pages being in a disarray here in front of me. I would like to do the concluding collect of the prayers of the people. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I would also add, like to add a couple of prayers from the evening prayer service from our Book of Common Prayer. And this prayer is a collect for Saturdays. O oh God, the source of eternal light, Shed forth your unending day upon us who watch for you, that our lips may praise you, our lives may bless you, and our worship on the morrow give you glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And also a collect for the presence of Christ. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night. Give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend to the sick. Lord Christ, give rest to the weary. 
bless the dying, soothe the suffering, pity the afflicted, shield the joyous, and all for your love's sake. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the Spirit. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. And now we would like to turn for our weekend update to Vestry member Steve Alexander. Unmute. <laughs> there we go. Uh, this is kind of where I was talking about uh, winging it a little. Uh, thank you so much, Chuck, for that uh, very fine explanation of the Acts of the Apostles, those particular verses. Um, I'm your senior warden, Steve Alexander. That's usually part of this. Um, I'd like to thank everyone, as usual, for all offerings. Uh, stop me if I'm wrong. Jesus feeds, we feast, we feed others. <laughs> uh, I'm not good at memorizing things, even, even short things. Um, briefly talk about uh, some of the things that have been going on on the grounds of the church. If, if, we have, if some of us haven't been there for quite a while, we have a uh, creek to the uh, west side of of the church that is has largely been uh overgrown filled with debris uh right now uh, thanks to rick cunine his friend kim and diane griner uh that has been transformed into a beautiful little flowing creek that winds around has little rapids it's a beautiful sight to see um there was a few spots that were encroaching too close to the parking lot and uh, some concrete building material that was unneeded at a building site has been donated. And uh, those three wonderful people worked on shoring up that uh, creek at that point and it looks beautiful. Uh, so many thanks. Um, anyway. Who am, I, who am I turning it back over, Marianne? To me. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Uh, also, thank you again to Chuck. A uh, brief reminder, if you would like to serve um, on our Saturday Night Live services, please contact Chuck, and he will get you set up and put you on the schedule to do a reading. Uh, as a quick reminder, we have Zoom Godly Play tomorrow at 10 a.m. and Zoom Bible Study at also 10 a.m. And, um, Marianne, yes, yeah, just like the before we uh, disembark for the coffee hour, I would like to give a special blessing to Travis and a special thank you to Travis. And Travis, as most of you are hopefully all of you know, uh, this is unfortunately is Travis's last evening with us. And Travis, we're we're going to miss you so much. You've been a blessing, uh, a, a wonderful person to get to know. Um, your music, I, I just, I wish we were in church again. I know we all do. Uh, those preludes and postludes that you would play were just out of this world. Um, you're going to be sorely missed, Travis. God bless you and good luck. And I second that also, and I believe we all do. We all give you, Travis, a round of applause and thank you for the service that you've given to St. Timothy's over the years. If you'd like to say a word before we um, open it up for coffee hour. Sure, thank you all very much. I am going to miss you. I hope you can hear me. Mm -hmm. Yes. I know it's such it's an odd time to leave. It's, it's so strange to be looking here through the computer, but I have so many fond memories of St. Timothy's and it's been a wonderful five years. And look me up on Facebook. I know many of you have already, so we can stay in touch. Thank you. And as a reminder, Travis will be back for one more uh, Saturday Night Live uh, once Reverend Rebecca is back from her vacation. So watch your uh, announcements and make sure you're here. And now on to coffee hour.